here we are, April 1st, welcoming Reginaldo back. There you are, Reginaldo. Got a beautiful ambiance there in the background. <laughs> um, so this is the uh, this is the second second um, pass on the topic of, of decolonization and indigenization, and um, it's been uh, I don't know if other people have had the experience that I've had, but I, I found it very uh, very fruitful um, concepts for me to use uh, as I go through life. So looking forward to this next um, next uh, <laughs> run through it. Take it away, Reggie. Thank you, Dan, and welcome everyone to the second installment of this series on decolonization and indigenization theory of change. I am now just waiting for my ability to share the screen so I can get you started. Just so you know, there is, during the opening ceremony back in February, we shared a, um, with Luis Marcos from the Comunidad Maya Pishanishim. He's a Guatemalan Maya and also spiritual leader. And we jointly did the opening ceremonial dedication and um, for the conference. And after that, uh, we went through a general exercise of mental decolonization, as we call it. And um, it's kind of a prerequisite if you are coming into this for the, you know, this is your first, um, your first time coming into this conversation. Uh, you need to remember that there is a lot of stuff we're not going to repeat from last time, mm -hmm. but it is crucial for understanding the concept that we are approaching today for the second time. And we will be doing this two more times before the conference series are over all the way through August, I believe. So with that in mind, um, let me go back and post disabled participating screen sharing. Um, so I don't have screen sharing privileges, uh, folks said by an agent. Uh, if you would um, habilitate that, I would appreciate that. It looks like you're a co-host now, so maybe you should be able to. There you go. Awesome. Thank you. I'm sure you will edit that little glitch out of the whole thing. Uh, first of all, the um, let me just make sure that this is on presentation mode. First of all, we understand agri regenerative agriculture uh, from an ancestral concept, not necessarily something to be defined in a paragraph or two, but rather it's a way of thinking. And it's an ancestral way, an indigenous way. By indigenous, we mean uh, when we come one with our origin, which is the elements of the earth that make up our body, our cells, the bacteria that surrounds our body, which is calculated what over 50 trillion or something like that. All of those elements are part of the earth. We are off the earth and from the earth. And that's what makes us indigenous to the earth. And regenerative thinking is simply a recognition of that and a return to, it, to that understanding as a foundation of how we go about living. That's really what regenerative is about. And it is a way of, it is, it has been primarily preserved by native communities <clears throat> across the world, which at this point is are estimated at roughly 20% of the total territory of the total land base of the earth and roughly about 370 million people. And those communities, across time, as colonization has raged around the world, they have preserved this way of being, of thinking, and of knowing and learning. And that is the foundation on which we talk about decolonization and indigenization of science, process, methodology, 
and the management processes and systems and science that we are using uh, on our farms. <clears throat> so again, we have done a little bit more of an extens extensive review of this. And today we're gonna skip some of that, but not without uh, some of the basic concepts. So, so we know what we're talking about. First of all, indigenization, again, understood from that description I just gave you, that concept, is a process of self or individual and collective reflection and conscientization that results in a way of seeing, comprehending, learning, interacting, and working as part of, not with nature, but as part of Earth's natural systems based on an identity that reflects our origin from the elements of the earth and consequently our interdependence with all living systems. A process by which we take our own responsibility to preserve and respect the evolutionary processes that generated the conditions that allowed for the emergence and will ensure the preservation of diversity of life on the planet. Literally what we are saying is we are the diversity of the planet. We are part of it. Our bodies are simply an assembly of energy that came together as part of the evolutionary processes that rendered our species to where it is today. But did that same process generated the rest of life on the planet? And we did not evolve individually. We evolved as part of an ecosystem. And to the extent that we indigenize our mind and understand that, then we will understand that without the rest of the ecosystems and the rest of living systems on life thriving, we don't thrive either. That is fundamental, what we are talking about. Decolonization is a bit different because decolonization is about the way we go about doing things and taking things over and destroying and, and so on. And so the decolonization process is really that that results in the transformation of ownership, control, and governance systems, and the structures that currently perpetrate the profit-driven extraction of the earth resources and the appropriation, destruction, expropriation, and extermination of indigenous centered cultures and resources, resulting in the disruption of earth's living systems. It is a process that results in the application of modern expressions of ancestral indigenous ways that place all living systems front and center as we define and plan the future. So when we get to, to that end purpose, which is indigenization, then the decolonization process results in that um, way of living and allowing for living systems to continue. So this is central to understand as we look into the remaining of this theory of change as we have uh, come to name it. Okay, so basic things that we need to take home because what we are, we are really talking about is the, um, it's an intellectual insurgency. I don't think there is another way to put that. This is literally an insurgent way of looking at the world around us. And if we are to honor the concept of being an insurgent in the best possible way, in this case, intellectually, then we have to understand that this is really about changing cultures, is about radical shift, shifts. So first of all, it's radical. Because of that, it's subversive. And why, why is it? It's because it's nature-based. Now, nature-based from an indigenous perspective, not nature-based from as in uh, a product that is based on natural processes out in the field, organic or, or whatever. See, that's, that's us outside of nature. It is actually nature-based, meaning everything we do emanates from the geoevolutionary blueprint of the earth in that we, in understanding that we are part of that blueprint rather than outside of it. It's insurgent because it is, this ways allows, allows us to build systems with integrity and commitment. There is not much integrity or commitment when you have a profit-driven um, approach to things. A subversive doesn't, it's a subversive mentality 
generates commitment and generates integrity as a foundation of how things are done, not necessarily for who or for whose benefit. In this case, things are done because we depend on doing things right, on preserving life, on a not disrupting the, due, the evolutionary processes of living systems on Earth. That's what makes it as an, a, a, an insurgent idea, the process of decolonization. It's revolutionary because it's really hard not, get, not to get excited about this unless you really don't care. If you don't care at all, yes, you're not part of this, of this insurgency and you probably won't, won't be motivated. But luckily for us, most people really care about themselves, about their health, about the food that they eat, about their kids and the world they're going to inherit. Most of us are not that callous, not to care at least a little bit. And that makes the concept of decolonization very revolutionary because it can be applied at scale, globally even. It's evolutionary because it's impact center and it is adaptable, it's agile, it's resilient in its strategy because it's not centered on someone somewhere having, a, having the say about what goes on, but rather its evolutionary nature is based on strategies of resiliency, which means the, the, the separation, the decentralization of power centers and decision makers and then energy centers and yes, the flow of energy between energy centers, but no different than mycelia. And if you look at the resiliency of mycelia, there is mycelia that is older than, it was all already old when the dinosaurs disappeared. And that same, those same families of mycelia still exist today and continue to define life on the planet. That is the concept of resiliency and evolutionary ability, agility. And that is the nature of something as, as strong as a, as a subversive way of thinking that in, ignites the insurgent within us that then generates the revolutionary nature that we are born with. Remember, we are born, born both colonizers and indigenous to the earth. And it is the one that we feed, the one that ends up dominating at the end of the day. And as we build the the, the, as we feed the indigenousness that we are born with, we end up in this process where we are continuously changing, adapting, and because of that, becoming resilient like mycelia. That is how we arrive at a destination that is regenerative. Regenerative was never intended to be a set of practices on the land, a set of market claims on our product, a set of certification criteria. That was not what regenerative was intended for by design as its original, as, uh, in its original ancestral concept. Yes, it's being colonized now, of course. It's being colonized according to the steps that we describe colonization processes go through. It was discovered by some folks who came into it in the last few decades. It was named regenerative, but it was really indigenous agriculture. Um, it was named regenerative. It's now being appropriated, even copyrighted in many places. It's being uh, taken out of context and used for profit, for more extraction, and so on. And that's the, the process of colonization. It's now being, um, the, the systems now of certification stuff are now locking out the very indigenous communities uh, and the native communities that who continue to practice indigenous ways that preserve this way of being and not even credited for it. And so that's where the credit belongs and that's where the original concept of nature, uh, regenerative comes from. And when practice according to that original concept with integrity, it doesn't matter if you label something regenerative or not. It doesn't matter if you call it regenerative or not. Regenerative simply is or is not. End of story, that's, that's all there is to it. So if you're regenerating, you will be competitive because regenerative is more competitive. But if you are not, it doesn't matter if you call it regenerative. And it won't be a, a, a solution to the planetary crisis we're living through. This is the uncompromising, and this is the process by which we can hopefully arrive at that uncompromising destination. So now, I am in the poultry system. I, I worked for the last two decades heavily on agronomics, science, methodology, management, and all that, uh, that is 
centered on poultry as a jungle fall. So that's what we call it poultry center agroforestry. It is also the place where we applied what I have just described for you. We applied a decolonized departing point, an indigenous way of seeing and working with the living systems we are part of. Within that concept is that we brought in the poultry into what we consider its geoevolutionary habitat, which is the jungle. So this, I'm gonna talk about poultry as a way to illustrate for you the process by which we have honored this ancestral way as we apply it to one large scale global opportunity for transforming the agricultural sector on the basis of an indigenous mindset, an indigenous mindset, which then focuses on developing the engineering processes, protocols, and all of that from that fundamental understanding that all living things are connected. And to the extent that we can adapt that way of thinking to the modern you know, needs for food and all of that, that we should and we have a responsibility to do that. And that's what makes our process regenerative, not because we call it regenerative, but because we designed it to regenerate. To regenerate what is what we're gonna try to, to spell out for you today. So as we think of decolonizing management, what is it that we are actually managing here? The first thing is the carbon cycle. If you look at the content of carbon, I mean, we are a carbon-based life for a reason, it's called that, right? So it's the most important and indispensable resource in regenerative agriculture. Without us farming for carbon and managing the carbon cycle as a central tenet of, this, of the currency that we are actually handling here, stewarding, that we are not really in the, in the, in the business of regenerative farming. Energy transformation and management is the foundation of efficiency in agriculture. We tend to fall for the colonizing idea that, you know, the, the, the yield per acre is a measure of efficiency, but it isn't. If it's taking more energy than the energy being harvested, then it is not efficient. Because at the end of the day, we farmers, we don't produce anything. We simply steward the process by which energy is transformed from non-edible forms into edible forms, whether it is CO2 and, and nutrients in the soil and biology and, and photosynthetic processes and, and ammonia in the air and, and, and ammonia in the soil or nitrates and so on and so forth, whether that energy is being transformed into wheat or into grasses to be eaten by a cow or a sheep or a, pork or a pig, or whether it's being turned into grain that then goes into our poultry systems, whatever. It doesn't matter. We're in the business of energy stewardship. And the foundation of efficiency is the rate of transformation of that energy from non-edible into edible forms. That is the foundation of efficiency in agriculture. Thermodynamics and naturally occurring biological, physical, and chemical processes are the foundation of production engineering and management sciences in regenerative agronomics. So it is not about, you know, whether you put a cover crop or whether you put organic uh, inputs into your farm. It's about working within the context of the permanent laws of thermodynamics, which established long ago that energy cannot be created, nor can it be destroyed. It can only be transformed. And we are in a constant chaotic natural process of evolution where energy is continuously being transformed, not only from elements into the forms of life, life that we already understand, but also those that we, don't, we haven't even discovered as far as, as our mind and, uh, mind and science capacity is concerned those life forms are still part of that evolution and that chaotic system, which is continuously transforming energy into ever and ever more diverse and sophisticated life forms, but it is the same energy, has been very little energy added to the planet. And a lot of the energy that was added through meteorites and other forms has been actually taken out in the form of spacecraft and junk and stuff like that that we put onto space. So at the end, the energy, the amount of energy is still pretty, pretty much the same from all practical purposes. So that is the foundation of, from, 
of the energy bank, so the currency we got to operate from, and to the extent that we interfere with those cycles that have allowed for that process of magnificent evolutionary process of energy management and transformation that the earth designed for us, to the extent that we interfere that with that and disrupt it, we're actually becoming less and less and less efficient. And that's how we ended up with the systems that we have today that are destroying the planet. And there, there is no confusion as to why. Well, they are squandering pretty much all of the energy and putting it in the wrong places at the wrong time. And then disrupting more cycles of energy, which then disrupt more and more. It's a cascading effect. So a single pound of nitrates entering into the soil or a single pound of toxic chemicals coming into the soil now destroys the, the biology. Without biology, then all of the other energy transformation processes stall. And if those stall, then life that depended on that doesn't evolve, doesn't continue to, to make it, or, is, or suffers and either decreases significantly or becomes you know, a lesser expression of what the geoevolutionary process is intended for that species to be. It is just impossible, impossible to argue nowadays with the scientific knowledge we have that doing anything that is counter to the natural processes leaves us with any benefit whatsoever. The collective enterprise ownership and management systems are the key to achieving higher competitive advantages in transforming systems management, ownership, control, and governance, with an emphasis on ownership, control, and governance, because that's what went wrong. When, as a society, we gave up ownership, control, and governance of the processes that transform energy from non-edible into edible forms, and then those edible forms become the property of a profit-driven extractive colonizing system, that's when we started to go the wrong way. And so only collectively can we decolonize management. And this foundation of it is how ownership, control, and governance is restructured going forward. So now if we're going to apply all of this to the chicken, then we start by, number one, understanding the chicken in the context of the jungle habitat and in the con context of biology. Why those three things? <clears throat> well, it happens that energy is transformed continuously at multiple levels, multiple speeds, multiple ratios, all the time, forever. Now, there are three places where we can pin the largest impact and the largest kind of epicenters of energy transformation. The first one is the photosynthetic process globally or at your farm. Doesn't matter how you look at it, that's the first place where energy is transformed on a mass scale. The second place is when some of those forms of energy already transformed, whether it is fruits, vegetables, or, or just biomass, cellulose, and so on, is taken up by either the chewing mechanism of some animals, like grass-eating animals, uh, foragers, or those that only have the intestinal tract, like in the case of the chicken. They don't chew, but they peck and swallow. And then they got a grinding mechanism in, uh, in the form of the gizzard that then takes that, that highly complex form of energy and break it down. Now, if you were to put that same material into a compost pile, it would be probably a year before you see soil put through the digestive tract of animals, all living animals on, uh, on earth from the worms all the way through the crickets, to the chickens, to the cows, to the horses, everything. Once you put it through that process of chewing and digestion, what happens is that energy that would have taken forever if you had not put engaged the digestive tract of the animals, it would take 48 hours, 72 hours to turn that into something that is coming out in the form of manure or eggs or beef or meat whatever it is that it was transformed in, happens at a very rapid pace. And at the same time, the byproduct of that, in this case, mostly manure and urine and all kinds of other intestinal metabolic byproducts, then feed the third, the third massive place where energy is transformed, which is in the soil. And this is why soil health is central, central to this efficiency of energy management and transformation. So these three places is where we hinge the overall science of management. And then behind that, what kind of management 
less intervention, more of the unleashing of the naturally occurring systems that are based on evolutionary processes that perfected them over billions of years. That's what the efficiency is. Now we got to play within the context of the current world, yes, but the foundation is indigenous. That's the key. And this allows us to decolonize how then we set up agronomical processes, protocols, even certification systems, if we ever need to do something like that. Now, the end, at the end of these processes, you're gonna have harvestable energy forms that can be turned into foods immediately or foods later on. So if it's fruits, maybe you turn them into value-added products, vegetables, maybe you wanna do the same. In this case, for the chicken, we are harvesting meat from the chicken, eggs from the chicken, fruits like elderberries and on multiple of other fruits that grow as the lower, uh, as the understory of the jungle-like habitat that we built for them. And also nuts and other pro products that grow higher up on the overstory above the poultry. At the end of the day, the poultry then becomes the, the ground level base uh, operation while supporting the underground operation, which is mostly microbiological and the upper level uh, energy management infrastructure, which is mostly photosynthetic. Now, some of the energy that was not harvestable as food right away go, undergoes multiple processes again, some of them physical, some of them chemical, and some of them biological. So for example, the giblets from the chicken, from the processing facility, can go to produce fish, um, meat-eating fish. Cross species feeding, is perfectly natural uh, in, in the evolutionary process of the earth. Mm. There are few animals that actually don't eat other animals. Um, we humans are one of those animals that eat other animals. Um, the tiger eats the deer and on and on the cycles of life goes. So there is a place for those giblets to be put back into a natural occurring energy transformation process that includes the chewing mechanism of another species like fish from where other byproducts in the form of ammonia suspended in the water is going to emerge. And then another opportunity to take that energy and transform it into other kinds of other bioirrigation uh, systems, for example, or fertigation as it's called, so that more energy gets transformed into other forms of, food, of um, expressions of energy that can be put on your plate and more byproducts. So the, 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 the process of energy transformation just doesn't end. Um, some of it, like manure, can be put straight into a field. And if the biology is, is healthy, um, immediately turn into available nutrients for other kinds of energy expressions, such as wheat, other grains, vegetables, nuts, um, medicinal herbs on the understory of other forests. Remember, we are talking about spaces where we are no longer putting chickens as the center of production, but rather just energy stewardship and management but there is no chickens necessarily, um, which then generate more energy expressions that can show up in our plate. Some of that energy, like grains and stuff, can go back into the system. That is a decolonized energy management center uh, approach um, and represents that true foundation of energy, um, of efficiency in agriculture center of energy stewardship. It also happens according to some uh, of the experts that we have shared this with and I have been analyzing this same concept of energy stewardship as a foundation of efficiency and microbiology and all of that as a foundation of energy transformation. It happens that in average, the edible energy out of a cycle is quite small. It's between 30 and 40%. And even if you put everything you want in a conventional system, corn is still going to be about 30%. Um, or soybeans, it's still gonna be about 30% harvestable energy anyway, with the difference that in those systems you squandered you know, many times over the energy harvest. And in this case, you're harvesting 30, 40% and 70% or so, 60% or 70 of the energy that you happen to have harvested in the process can actually go into your energy seed bank for the next cycle on the next year or on the next crop or on the next biological activity, it's never ending. And it is self-sufficient. Self and that is what makes it regenerative. It regenerates. It doesn't use up anything. It doesn't extract. 
Well, maybe it does extract CO2 out of the atmosphere, which we have too much of it, by the way. So that's a good thing. If we're going to extract, let's do it from where, where there is excess that is actually ca causing harm. Um, so if we're going to extract wealth, well, let's extract it out of the atmosphere, like CO2. There is too much of it in too few individuals, and that hopefully we can spread out so that everybody can do better. Same with carbon, uh, CO2 in the air. I think we need to extract it out of there and distribute it among the farms and the soil or microorganisms and make it common again. When you think of this system from these two perspectives, decolonized management and indigenized view, the naturally occurring energy system, transformation systems then become the foundation of that engineering and management in the science and in the regenerative agronomics. But why, how is this applied to an actual physical space? Well, you have to think of the space as a, first of all, if you look at the land as a three-dimensional space, an acre to us in the regenerative poultry system is not a square area. It's not 43,600 square feet. It's actually 43,600 plus multiplied by around 24 feet up in the air at least and 12 feet down in the, into the soil. So is that multiply, you know, cube 36 feet of height. And I, I believe that's almost 2 million uh, cubic feet. Now that is the energy, the, 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 the space that we operate in to transform energy from non-edible into edible forms. That is a completely different decolonized and more indigenous way of thinking about the land when you go out there and stand in front of your field and you're trying to figure out what is it that you're gonna do. And by the way, this is not just for chickens. I mean, you can use this, this process for anything you wanna do on that land. And as long as you see it from that perspective and want to and are open to and able to become intellectually acute and in line with this way of thinking and doing things, you don't actually need degrees for this, masters or otherwise. What you need is intellectual ability to understand what's going on, but that doesn't come from formal education, as we call it, which is more like training, training your mind to see things a certain way. In this case, it's about unleashing the innate knowledge and the innate intelligence, which is much superior to any acquired training that you may uh, absorb from conventional institutions. That's valuable too. I'm not depreciating it completely, I mean, a little bit. But the idea is that if you take that knowledge and take a little bit of that knowledge and apply the wisdom that comes from innate, innate intelligence and the intellectual awareness, which is generated through meditation, observation, storytelling, and sharing, listening, and just becoming one and indigenous with the space, if you allow for that innate intelligence to be unleashed and turn into wisdom as to how you work with the land, then a little bit of knowledge from the conventional system can go a long way. The problem is that we take 99.99% .99 knowledge and very little wisdom, and that's how we are wrecking the planet. So now let's look at further decolonization, where we look at this same piece of land as a four-dimensional space. What's the fourth dimension? In the indigenization process, we're looking at the process of farming from nature's design while adapting to modern methodology, right? So if we are doing that, then we are decolonizing the process by which we manage this space. Now, that means less artificial cost. And literally, it means less tractor time, less labor, less artificiality in it. Improve harvest because plants do express their nature and their full potential when you allow for the environment to be the one they evolved in. When, manipul when we manipulate that environment to our homocentric idea of what should happen in there, then we squandered the harvesting, the, the energy management and transformation capacity of the species. So yes, Decolonization means improved harvest, also higher nutritional density and quality, 
it's just natural that that's going to be the, the result because you are giving the plant or the animal its original habitat from which it, its own geoevolutionary blueprint is tuned up to. And when you do that, the quality, the nutritional density, everything, the health of that animal in the ecosystem is going to be superior. System level, level integrity, this is what we are talking about. When you become one with that space, there's a level of integrity that's just natural. You can't lie to yourself. Higher value for consumers? Of course. I mean, this, when you, uh, as a consumer, when you as a consumer are not just buying fill, but rather are buying nutrition, then this is the way you buy nutrition. Very inexpensive, by the way. From a nutritional perspective, a regenerative, a regenerative, regenerative food is probably half the cost of conventional products. Why? Because conventional products don't have the nutritional density. And if you are buying nutrition, on the basis of nutritional purchasing, nutrition purchasing, you the nutrition in a product that is three times more expensive than a conventional product, the nutritional value is actually much higher, which we calculated is about half of the nutritional value of a supposedly cheap product. So from a perspective of food cost, this is probably half the cost from a nutritional perspective than a conventional product. Elimination of external cost, which result in increased collective ecological wealth. There is no external cost. We are not talking about externalities here because everything is internal because it is based on the blueprint of the earth, not from outside extracting and destroying, but rather enhancing that ecosystem so that the, so what we harvest in the form of edible energy has that integrity. And because of that, there is no such thing as external cost. There is only ecological wealth on which the system depends. And that delivers better results for all of us collectively. And because of that, the health and the overall well-being of the system is ensured. Now, if you look at this from a decolonization, indigenization, both of management and viewpoints and so on, what you end up is, what I just described here is a spiritual connection to food, to the land, and to the living systems of the earth. And that is the fourth dimension. Regenerative agriculture is fourth dimensional. And it is only through the spiritual connection and the appreciation of that space where we become indigenized. Only through that process it is that we can manage and achieve regenerative triple bottom line outcomes. The opposite is simply always going to be a, um, a, a road to the whitewashing. Now, apply to the chicken and apply to the modern conditions that we have and the tools and the resources we have to work with. These are day old chicks. They arrive, there's a propane tank, there's a heater, drinkers, um, feeders, uh, rondelle made out of a um, polycarbonate sheet cut two feet high, um, circular so that chickens don't pile up in corners and we lose more. Um, basic stuff, not really that, that complicated, right? We have this management protocol. If you want to learn the specifics of everyday activities and how we actually manage the chicken day to day, uh, we are launching a, a massive training um, platform under the regenpoultry.com. Uh, that's R-E-G-E-N poultry.com. Now, this is what's called the brooding period, which for the broilers and for the egg layers too, last for four weeks. So they arrive, they stay in that space, they grow secondary feathers, strong legs, and they are very alert and they really start to, to want to roam a little bit farther. So while they were inside the building, we are preparing the outdoors. In this case, ensuring that the original food on which chickens evolved is actually present. By that, we mean mostly uh, forages and sprouted grain but especially shade from the understory and the, up, up, the overstory of the outdoor space where they're going to range. There is a multitude of benefits that come from this, just to give you a glimpse of it. The manure that they deposited, the previous flock deposited, is now transforming into energy that shows up as forages. The sprouting systems harvest a massive amount of that energy to the extent that some cases, for example, the iron content of a dry kernel of corn is around 29 parts per million. 
uh, when it's dried. When it's sprouted in this space, it increases to between 28 and 2,900 parts per million. It goes from 29 to 2,900. So you do the math. In fact, we theorize that if you were to put that kind of iron into the feed system, you probably killed your chickens on the spot. And yet, that iron, which was sitting there in the soil and showed up in the lab tests that we did for the sprouts, ensured that the chickens had shinier feathers, brighter eyes, better health, more resilience. We lost less chickens to diseases. They had less leg problems. All of it, at the end, was turned into a benefit because we were managing the energy in that space. Now, that's also possible because we got the shade of the trees, which keep the temperature of the soil lower, which keeps the, hum the humidity higher because the ev evapotranspiration processes slow down, which that, that means that there's more biology on that soil, which means there is more energy transformation going on in, under the soil, which means there is more available energy for the sprouts and the forages to harvest more density, which then they eat the chicken eats, and that results in a higher density nutritional, nutritionally valuable either egg or chicken. Just to give you a glimpse, there is way more to where that came from, but just to give you an idea of what it means to look at the space from an indigenous perspective, meaning managing energy instead of, instead of production. So while the chickens were inside, if you don't have a canopy made out of hazelnuts and elderberries and or other species in your area. You know, in Mexico, we use um, uh, mulberries uh, and also sunflowers, but also in the high, in the high desert, um, olive trees. So in this case, this is in Minnesota. We didn't have a canopy yet. The hazelnuts are still very small. So we use corn, I mean, sunflowers, alternated with corn year after year to create a canopy in the same conditions that later on the perennial crops are going to generate. We're putting them up so that when they come out, you can see the chickens. But this is on the fourth week, actually on the first day of the fifth week, when they start uh, being trained to range outdoors. And when they are no longer fed a single grain or a single pound of feed indoors anymore, all of the feed is moved outdoors. So whether it's egg layers or broilers, it doesn't matter. Um, the system works equally well with the difference that for the egg layers, the blueprint of the space, ranging area, all the protocols change for hens um, versus uh, brothers because of their, their nature and their behaviors, habits, and all of that. One of the byproducts, again, is the hazelnut. Now, five years ago, we started harvesting hazelnuts. Every year, the hazelnut increased in productivity to the extent that now the hazelnuts inside the paddocks where the chickens roam are outproducing the hazelnuts outside of the paddocks by a ratio of two and three times. Why? Well, there's more energy transformation capacity in there. There's more health in the ecosystem. Now some of the byproducts turn into, into wood chips and we can put those straight back. In this case, the sunflower stems, and, and we, we harvested them and because they were, these are really soft materials, we turn them into biochar in a homemade reactor and then spread that in, back into the field so that we could ignite a whole new level of biological activity in that soil. Now you take that unit of production, you move it into a farm design. What you have then is an area in the bottom of this picture, you see the poultry production units with the paddocks and the canopies and all of that. And then north of that, in the upper part, you see, you know, this is 32 acres in total, 30 acres of alley cropping systems where you bring the manure and all of the byproducts from the, from the buildings that are collected in the buildings, and then you can use it to, to scale up the, the production of the same perennials uh, that you put into the paddocks, no longer with uh, the presence of chickens, but it's still you know, fed and sustained with the energy from the chickens in the form of processed manure. Now, in the bottom part of this, just so you know, we put a, what we call a pork run. Uh, it's 40 foot wide, plus a buffer between the neighbor on the south and the farm. Because this farm is now certified organic, we needed at least a 30 foot buffer on the south side. But also uh, we planted it so that we could run pigs under that. So we planted it with oaks and other nut species. But what happens then is that 
the the pork as they are ran from the on the bottom here. We left the space so that we can harvest hazelnuts and feed them to them on the on the run, but also so they can be put in back into the paddocks when the hazelnuts are being dropped and have the the pigs harvest all of that. For us, it's actually just as good because we are turning a a raw material into a value added product, which is pork meat. You don't need factories to manage energy like this efficiently. So this is that same farm. The hazelnuts are still developing. You can see them in the center there, um, just coming up. Uh, the chickens are now weeding and fertilizing them. And you know, this is like two and a half, three years ago. Uh, this hazelnut started producing last year and 2021 is gonna be a more regular production year. Same farm, starting to see the hazelnuts. We started with a bare field. This is a mature canopy with an upper canopy almost poking past the elderberries and chickens still being raised after 13 years, still being raised, same space. No excess nutrients, no accumulation. Uh, we still have to, we still have to see a single year when anything measures above, um, but it's expected. And, and an indicator of the health of that space there is the quality of elderberries and hazelnuts uh, we are obtaining out of the trees. And these are apples that we put in the middle there as a test. There's a whole story behind them, um, which I can tell you in the training platform. Just quickly, just so you can see, you know, what happens. Chores in the morning are limited to setting up the feed and opening the door. Takes us about 30 minutes to 45 minutes max when we did, and we had to do other things like spread hay or grain or something to manage 1,500 chickens. Now, look at the vitality of the animals. This is the day when they are going to the processor. They are fully grown, six and six and a quarter pound broilers. What you see on the ground here is comfrey. It's a medicinal herb that also allows us to, um, to manage all kinds of diseases that would normally affect birds like this, but also um, gives them strength and high in protein, 26%, very low in um, fiber, which takes a lot of energy to, to digest. So very good combination, 11% or so fiber, 26% protein, and chickens normally go for the forages that have higher protein. So it was very easy for us to select that uh, comfrey as, a, as a, a pivoting forage for the fields. Now managing energy is just, you know, composting in this case, yes, but sheet composting which means we put this out there. We don't put them into a heap that is gonna heat. Rather, we put it out in the field and we plant something that, that can be um, used with fresh manure. And then on the following season, we can put the vegetables and other, other things that, don't, that are not allowed uh, with fresh manure in it. But by the second season, all of this manure, it has, we already have harvested either flowers or something else that are not for eating. And the following year, we put them back into edible, um, edible products. And this very space we are looking at um, is now on the eighth year, and we're still harvesting just the same quality of produce as we were producing the first year without any new intervention energy-wise, except the original one. So energy management. There's no chickens here, but we're still working on the chickens, on the chicken energy. This is um, black beans, the ethnic food that we grow in the family and central to our diet, same as chickens and eggs. Garlic, you know, energy-wise, nutritionally speaking, the nutritional profile of garlic, very close to the nutritional profile of the, of the wood chip and manure mixing that we do. First, pollinators. I mean, why wouldn't we have pollinators in the space that need so much, that can feed so much life? 
So yeah, central. Hazelnuts, central to the whole process. As we harvest more of that, we have also integrated this process um, into educational courses where we would eat for up to a month only the products, uh, only the harvests from the farm. And we have had the most complete meals with no, no other inputs except salt and basic things. I mean, of course, it's limited still, but nutritionally speaking, complete. Uh, if you had to survive in a space, you wouldn't need anything else. Um, everything else is like, it's, it's nice, it's good. It's good to have sugar uh, in here, but as far as your body needs, the sweet corn is plenty of sugar. You don't need to put sugar in a coffee or anything like that. I mean, you put it because of pleasure, fine. But from a needs perspective, if we push came to shop, these farms can actually um, sustain the families. And not only that, but you take these vegetables and you dehydrate them and you can store them for the winter. You take the roots that are in the little pot, same thing. The chicken, we freeze it and we, we sometimes eat two-year-old chicken, just as good, it was frozen. Corn, you can do the same thing. Oh, water is from the wild. So, and the tortillas that you see in the little pot, those were made from organic corn, which can be harvested right here on the farm as well. In this case, it was. Normally, we don't harvest enough, but we even have a little hand-cranked grinder that we can use to produce our own tortillas right here on the farm. And in this case, we did because we needed to do an experiment with kids where we taught them the whole process all the way from the niche tamalization process all the way till the tortillas emerged. Now, this is energy management, energy stewardship right here. We're not talking about producing food. These are simply energy expressions that came out of the process. So decolonizing ownership and control, building layers of collective impact. That's what we are doing. We are organizing now as, as affinity groups so that we start establishing ownership and control of areas where all of the poultry producers come into a collective so that we can then oversee our own interests. No different than other groups have done already. Measuring wealth creation based on indicators of collective well-being. So if a farmer made a lot of money it's not as relevant to us as if we balanced out the difference between the ones that did well and the ones that did not do too well. That is what is called collective well being. And that is how we measure whether there is wealth creation or not. Designing for a scale without compromising family, community, and local resilience. We have laid out the blueprint on how you can do that. And all we did was put a methodical, discipline, decolonization, indigenization blueprint into the very things we already do, like chickens. One of the things we have done is brought out uh, folks from the inner city who wanted accessible um, a chicken that was accessible price-wise. Now, if you harvest chicken, you can bring home the giblets. Um, you don't have to transport it to the processor. You don't have to pay for that processing. You, you do it yourself. At the end of the day, if you were to buy one of these chickens at the grocery store, it would cost you, in net terms, if they sold you everything that you take home from the farm, it would cost you around $30. Now, what they sell you is just the, the, the carcass, sometimes with the neck in it, but never the giblets or anything. Now, it happens that the giblets, the gizzard, the, 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 the liver, the heart, uh, the legs even, that's where the most nutritional density is. It's not in the, in the, in the breast. There's some more nutritional density in the dark meat, but the real medicinal value of a chicken is in the giblets, and all of that is thrown away. And so what you are getting back at the store is really a, a lower amount of nutrition and value in terms of medicinal value at a very high cost. So a farmer, for us... <coughs> Excuse me, a chicken would cost us between $7.50 to $8 to raise it. And we make a dollar out of each chicken. Now that's fine with us. We, we're happy with a dollar per chicken. In fact, talk to any chicken grower in the conventional system. And if they made five cents, they're probably happy. Now that farmer, that family from the inner city came out and bought the chicken from the farmer at $8. Now the farmer did really well. 
The person got that chicken for a dollar, processed it themselves, and brought home the equivalent of $30 worth of value, of nutrition. And yet, it cost cash-wise just $8. Now, that is competitive with any cheap chicken in the market as far as cash outlay from the family is concerned. And it's not like you don't have to go and work to earn the money to buy cheap food anyway. But in this case, you didn't waste your time doing that. Instead, you put it into bringing more nutrition home. That is what we call food access, nutritional, nutrition access, not just fill, but actual food. Now, there's layers. We can do the farm thing that's limited, or we can do the mobile processing facilities, which we have one deployed in the Pine Ridge Reservation in partnership with McCoy Ag Development. That can, can do up to 1,500 chickens a day. It's a pretty sophisticated system. We bought it ready to deploy. And then this last year, we bought an actual processing facility, a fixed facility in Stacyville, Iowa, with capacity for 1 million broilers. Now, that is more of the scale that we wanted to, to reach. And collectively, we could do that. We could think at a regional scale. We partner with multiple institutions and business developers and investors and all that, and we were able to put this together. That would allow us to now deploy 50 of those farm operations that we were talking to you about. And it also allowed us to launch a collectively owned and managed um, brand. This is actually now looking at the democratization and decolonization of the supply chain. And it is very competitive, it's very efficient, it's just to everyone involved, especially the farmers. It's fair, it's inclusive, because now you got all kinds of small farmers. I mean, one production unit for broiler is only one and a half acres. Everyone can have a production unit, but as a production unit, you're never gonna be able to support a processing facility. So that diversity and inclusivity in design and also in approach actually allows us to collectively be able to have, you know, a product, a processing facility, a brand, and all of those things that is more in competition and or is more competitive in the open market than if we were trying to sell 1,500 chickens from a single production unit on our own individually. So. When you think of this as enterprise sectors instead of farms, you've got egg, the egg sector, so the network of farmers producing eggs, the network of farmers producing broilers, the processing facility for both eggs and broilers that we now collectively own, the fish production system that is also a collective of fish producers that use the byproducts, all of those byproducts, manure from both the fish and the chickens going into vegetable production and processing, and as those processes are put in place, value-added products can come out. Transportation systems are going to be necessary. And because we're working at scale, we can launch our own, our own transportation uh, fleets. Warehousing, same thing. Services, same thing. Financial services, the same thing. Now we can take agroforestry products and also work with them, even though the farms may be an acre big or two. Collectively, we have the capacity to bring these agroforestry systems into a scale that allows us to be sustainable financially in competitive market wise. Grain production then becomes a mainstream part of it and grain processing also. Altogether, we're looking at over 20 enterprise sectors that then come together under an ecosystem level uh, strategy for management, all symbiotically connected, where we, if we put $1 in, we get $12 of value out. I mean, not out, because it just circulates. It's called circular economies. That is what a system level blueprint looks like. And for it to be regenerative, it must be organized on the basis of the symbiosis that the biophysical chemical processes of the earth have delivered us. And then us being smart enough to not colonize the ownership and control, but rather decolonize it so we can achieve actual wealth generation and system level demand for services. Right now, we're working in the Midwest primarily, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Iowa. We plan to go to produce, to set up at least one processing facility on each of the, of the uh, continental 48 states. And as a result of that, reach the level of throughput that is necessary to hopefully achieve around 5% of the total 
production of eggs and broilers in the country. As far as governing, we're going to leave it at this now because the governance, we're going to tackle this in the next session. Uh, this is our decolonized governing, ownership, and control structure, where the outer perimeter is all of the state based operations. And then the councils, the inner circles include governing structures uh, from the councils uh, that are governing the individual operations and regions uh, coming together to create regional councils and then more consolidated regional councils and until we get to the center, which is what we call, in the case of poultry, we're calling it the Regenerative, um, Regenerative Poultry Congress of America. And when we reach that point, then we will have a alternative regenerative poultry industry in the United States. That is the story of decolonization and indigenization that I wanted to share with you. Well, thank you very much, Lenny. It's always a, a pleasure getting to uh, experience your your brilliance, your your deep thought and understanding, and then your practice. Um, you know, walking the talk. It's it's really very inspiring, and I, I'm <clears throat> Sam says great presentation. I'm I'm guessing people's wheels are turning, um, gears are turning in their heads, as it were. Um, we've got about half an hour left, and um, just a one real question here. So. Anybody that would like to engage, feel free to start typing in the Q&A box. Um, this was from uh, Bill and Jay that came in uh, fairly early in the in the presentation. As I see these decolonization slides, I think of how these impulses most people feel but have not understood led to the January 6 riots. That is, these ideas are perverted by their leader. How do we harness and educate the millions ready for change to these realities? Can government be reformed? I think I know. I might have some ideas about where you're going with that, but there's a, <laughs> how would you like to address that? Okay, I just realized that there's a Q&A, sorry. Um, so yeah. <sighs> um. You were ready to get up and, <laughs> get up and say goodbye. Well, <laughs> no, uh, how do we harness and educate the millions ready for change? Israel, see, the, the thing is that, Yeah. Um, this is more than education. This is actually more about intellectual awareness. And the thing with thinking that we need to go and educate is actually assumes that we know better. Yeah. And that's not true. We are actually born with an innate intelligence and a blueprint that, that we can just access to. If we were to do something, I would say, Maybe like folks are doing yoga on YouTube every day now. We we need a decolonizing and indigenization version of that, where we actually do daily exercises and we 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 put them out there so that people can you know recite mantras just like we get indoctrinated into religion and stuff. I think at the end of the day, that's how our brains work. That's how we have shaped the current colonizing system, and in a way, we can use some of that conventional methodology to actually achieve these kinds of. Um, coming one with the um, with the indigenous nature we are born with, and honestly, that intellectual ability is what matters, which is truly the expression and the definition of education. Education is not something you do individually. Education is our collective ability to actually shift and create change. The individual aspect of this is is, is called training. I can train you on how to raise chickens, but I can't educate you on how to change the system. That is something that you're going to have to seek for yourself. And yes, we will mentor. We will create mentorships and we'll build all of that. But it is a, it is a journey. It is a journey, not a, not a destination right away. It doesn't result because you came to the workshop. Uh, that education is going to take a, a little bit longer. But here's the thing. As long as we stop doing the wrong things, we're already way on the way to reversing the stuff that we're doing that is damaging our planet today. So I like the idea of thinking that we already are educated. We just simply haven't allowed that education to emerge and to define how we do things. That is the indigenization process. And that's why I wanted to focus on indigenizing the mind more than anything else. Because once you do that, everyone will realize we were, nothing I said today was unknown to them. That is probably the most beautiful expression of what we're doing here. That if you really think about it deeply, nothing I said 
was unknown by any in this workshop. That is called innate intelligence. We already have it. I'm just helping you discover it. Um, <clears throat> beautiful. Okay, uh, Bryn uh, says, wow, can you say more about the expansion to other states? What is needed to make it happen? Yeah, so at this point, we, we, we have streamlined that process a little bit. First thing we need is an operating partner, someone, a group, preferably, that is willing to say, yes, we want to start with the chicken. Or we, if you're going to start with another animal, then um, find those around you that are that understand pork, for example, and then apply the same blueprint, process blueprint, not the, the, the methodology we use for chicken. But if you want to expand just the, the, not the concept, but the actual poultry system, what we need is an operating partner first. That operating partner then has full access to the curriculum and to the mentorship from the current cohort that we have in Southeastern Minnesota and Wisconsin and Iowa. And then with that, the new, the operating partner and their team in the, in the smaller ecosystem is trained on how to assemble all of the different layers and to organize the different layers and bring together the regional blueprint to life. And then as they do that, then we come in with the, with the branding and all the other stuff so that we actually are fully coordinated while completely independently or locally owned, governed, structure, and all of that. But we still have that standardization process so that at the end of the day, we still are very competitive in the marketplace. So as long as we have those, those pieces in place, and of course, those operating partners are going to have to have capacity, just like the capacity we built in Southeastern Minnesota. We found people, we found capital, we did all of the legwork and we implemented that infrastructure. That's exactly the job that they will do in their own regions. And that's how we are expanding right now to Omaha with the Pishanishim Maya community out of Omaha. This is a community of immigrant Guatemalans from the Mayan, Mayan displaced folks by the war. And they are agrarian. They, their whole foundation is, is, is in this kind of ways of thinking and ancestral ways of working with nature, you know, as part of nature. And so, so they were, you know, more or less natural partners. And now we're working with them to develop that capacity to deploy that system. And we can repeat that process 50, 48 times across the United States, whatever there are folks who feel that, yeah, they're gonna dedicate uh, energy and time to this. And by the way, if you don't wanna this, do this for the rest of your life, it, it ain't gonna work because this is not something that you, you try it for a year and then, I mean, you're just gonna lose a lot of investments because like the hazelnuts, they're gonna be in full production in six years. Um, the, 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 the land gener regenerates you. We took, uh, you know, decimated, uh, corn, soybean rotate, rotated, uh, land and turn it around in three years. Uh, and then from the three years forward, everything started to, to really climb up in terms of, um, ability to transform energy and to yield and so on and so forth. But you don't want to stop that five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years into it. That's when it started to get better. And so... If you're not making a commitment for the long run, uh, permaculture, agroforestry, it, it's simply not for you. So um, think of that first. Think of all of those things. Decolonize your mind. Uh, indigenize your ways. And when you're done with that, then let's talk about partnerships and expansion. <laughs> uh, that's that's a great answer. Um, I just uh, maybe a follow up here from JVT. Um, we have 12 acres in Virginia near the Chesapeake Peak Bay and are interested in getting started. Yes, we want to start with chickens. Are we too small to qualify um, as an operating partner? No. The, what you have to remember is that the operating partner is not a farm. Yeah, exactly. The operating partner is a, is an operating enterprise that sets its 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 goals um, on organizing the ecosystem, not on growing chickens. Uh, now, I'm doing that too. I'm overseeing the ecosystem development. I would be an operating partner to someone else if someone else was leading this. Now, I am also a farmer. So no, you're never too small because we only need one and a half acres per production unit. But if you think that you are an operating partner because you grow, because you have an operating uh, a production unit, then you're wrong because that's not the operating partner. The operating partner is, is the business that puts together the clusters and the regional plans and does the business development. And then yes, as part of that cohort, 
then your 12 acres is not actually is the perfect size for a farm, but the farm is not an operating partner. They are the, 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 the they are who populate the region. The, the operating partner is, is, is an entity, is an institution, is an enterprise. Beautiful. Um, so a couple uh, questions, points here. One, um, Martha says, are there comparable initiatives with other kinds of livestock? And um, David Strelnick uh, notes that he'll be presenting in July on other enterprise examples around the world uh, from, operating from a similar framework. Um, so there'll be another presentation <clears throat> on a more global context, not just chickens, but a similar model. But uh, Martha's question, are there more other comparable initiatives with other kinds of livestock that you're familiar with? Oh, absolutely. See, the, 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 what lay, I laid out for you, I used the example of the chicken. But yep. what I laid out for you was not a way to produce chickens. I wasn't training you, any of you, on raising chickens. I was simply laying out a process framework. And that I process that framework. I'm aware of other, other groups that actually are extant right now doing this kind of thing with pigs or, or cows or whatever else. Yeah, holistic management. I mean, has most of the principles we're talking about. The 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 um, uh, bionutrient. Um, you guys, uh, the Bionutrient Food Association. You guys are are approaching other animal production like this. The grass fed exchange. The folks doing grass fed beef. Uh, it's not exactly the same blueprint because obviously this is this is coming from a whole different background. But yeah, I mean, if you look at folks who are now uh, like the um, the uh, you know Iverico uh, pork out of Spain, for example, and it's over over sixteen hundred farmers. The system is, I believe, over one thousand years old. Uh, they have been raising that pork in the same forest forever. Uh, the forests have done better because of that. Uh, the the Hesas in Spain, those are completely energy management systems. They just don't call them that. Yeah. Um, so there is plenty of examples of of how this blueprint is.
used for many other animal species. Um, now, if we could come together and actually develop curriculum so that we could actually streamline this, um, it would be beautiful. We just haven't had the time to do that. And our primary role was social. It was not about animals or even agriculture. It was about social transformation in the agriculture landscape. And to do that, we needed to engage people at the larger scale possible, both consumers, enterprises in the middle, and farmers. And if we were to be regenerative, meaning work on the basis of energy management and transformation, we needed to pick a livestock to get started. And the only livestock that allowed us to have the social impact we wanted to have was the chicken. That's why we picked the chicken. But we could have taken the same process if pork had allowed us to engage at this at the scale of social change that we want to create as a result of this work then we would have picked pork or, or cows, and we would have applied the same exact process blueprint. It's just that chickens gave us the key to the kingdom, so to speak. Nice. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, from a traditional perspective, as I understand it, that's how the indigenous communities were managing the, the deer and the kangaroos and whatever else, depending on which continent you were on. They were, you know, the landscape was managed so that the animals were freely roaming, but they had what they needed to eat and they were easily considered to be harvested um, with very, very little extra effort. The so um, not necessarily a current model, but one that I think is before we could even um, <clears throat> to the extent there that we do that, we <laughs> in the history books, if you want to look, look and see. Uh, Emmanuel says, what, if any, uh, what is, if any, role of the cooperatives in your governance and organization system? I think you talked about that a little bit, but probably doesn't hurt to elaborate. Oh, absolutely. Uh, think of it this way. But then you are working with an, with an NGO, capacity, cooperative, LLC, C Corp, S Corp, whatever it is, those are simply tools. To be engaged, if the objective at the end of the day is a harmonization and distribution of ownership and control and governance, you can achieve it without even a, a legal incorporation, uh, legal incorporation paper. I mean, you could have all individually owned farms, and as long as they can understand the power of collective action, they can come together with no. Is a structural, the right legal structure, and body, still achieve the same goal. So, yes, and the but same happens to that end. You point, point we have now you um, set the date for incorporating and launching that we would the first of the many tree range um, uh, farmer cooperatives. So, further, um, we are choosing the, the cooperative structure at this point because it gives us the most accurate you know, expression of what we want to do. In the Southeast Minnesota, even interested and, in validating and that, in the border that region with Wisconsin and Iowa. Yeah. We're not prescribing that. We're not saying All that right. that's the way uh, to do it. James that's the way we're choosing asks, to do it in that um, region. Somebody else comes up with a better idea somewhere else. Yeah, safety. as long as the ownership, control, and governance is distributed. Well, and it reflects the decolonizing food safety uh, processes, but you can surely undo all, good. all in Guatemala, the for example, being sold uh, in the farmers' name food safety. Just are used to organizing <laughs> um, associations. So they are not, that's probably what he's talking know, about. What, what are your, civil yes. society. So let's talk about food um, safety. Is a, is a, well, let's not uh, talk a about civil food societies safety. are actually policies, a right? form of incorporation. So policies are uh, a very so different thing. They, that's another form. What we have been so again has been put in place about the end goal is about the outcomes, not the matter. And if cooperative structures allows us the to a structure that governs corporations so that, that want to make it difficult well, absolutely. for food that. with integrity and that's what we're doing to in the marketplace. Again, I'm not saying a collective that. scale that can uh, threaten the hegemony uh, over the control and ownership and yeah. governance of the food okay, system. Okay, a couple of um, about Those predation and uh, rules Sam says in the name of <clears> you only people, uh, mentioned contrary to address wild bird diseases. Safety. Is that all you need? I work with a multi species poultry farmer and he uses other natural medicines to keep them healthy. Also, if we struggle with foxes, somebody using high fences and companion it. dogs, question mark. So, and Nina says, you that you're gonna do you have predation problems? If do you produce this law broilers year-round? So more restriction on how you can process your chickens, for example. Okay, we don't well, produce broilers year-round, okay but with also, it. you know, I but forgot to tell you that we, we have in right Minnesota. Now. So now the way to the colonize these. cold there. Um, One way, we are not anyway, suckers for punishment. So we definitely want to take a break in, this, of in the scientific winter. evidence. So we grow start from the ground up. The other thing, undoing um, a lot of the restrictions that have been written into oh, ordinances and codes and all um, of that. So that the we thing can is predators, rebuild um, the, the If you the approach village predators from an indigenous system, perspective, and I'd say the, way the village you develop system this because in this I system, had this, this Chinese first student all, who came to like visit and did his internship right? so in my farm. So think like a chicken, and you want when, and we a went canopy to because farms to have dinner. You can't go outside and if you're a chicken. You can't go outside. He just fell in love. He called it village because 
you, you, you don't and have the reason is because uh, back in China, I guess that's the only place you can so get that quality around, food. If you turn around, you're blinded by the yeah. sun. And so you know that if you're that blinded, is, you can't see it. That is the way to be colonized. And if you have, right now, thing, we still got choices. Not to expose because if you butcher a chicken on your farm and you feed it to your family and your friends there, and That's why everybody is, is, is consenting to eating that chicken, they can up then they can the, the, the regulations just to give that were built to what block what you from being like able to use that Another same methodology that to chicken, enter the like marketplace, which is what the regulations are about, they don't interfere there with you, at least not yet. That's how we structure the And so that is a place we can start decolonizing from the bottom up. And then... So that Taking that data because that that's perfectly safe food. That's one level. That's not the, the issue. Isn't is food safe? Most but of the it, because it is perfectly there, safe. That take the data, out, uh, document they do that it, on the night, aggregate it. And if we are able to organize uh, in the, in the way the we're evening. going to discuss so on this the next the shelter, round yeah, of this, the if we organize that way, so then we can take that and make that the norm. Because Almost it is, I mean, that is every perfectly that safe shelter, food. And we it's put just the not, strongest materials and it, all of that uh, so that nothing you know, can get uh, in. It, it probably won't and we fulfill the or meet the since current they, since um, one of uh, weak barriers that, that have been written into out, law. We train them to go in. All right, I think we've got own, time so maybe for one more. Them, um, but also, uh, so Sherry, it's uh, a bit of a long long sort of thought, but then ends with a question. I love the concept of indigenous wisdom we are born with. We live in a world where we feel required to obtain education and training. Most of us feel like education is the only way to understand things. I'm trying to educate people about the innate ability to detect nutrition through our sense of taste, which of course ultimately requires us to grow flavorful food in regenerative living soils. It's a huge challenge to get people to trust their innate wisdom. How do you help instill a trust in innate wisdom? Um, you have to do it because, come, unfortunately, yes, they, yes they that is about the training. They come out the night. Um, There's nothing for them to let's do remember the that no education is, 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 is so intended to do more to think like a predator, uh, about think training like a and robot. what some like tree, you know. uh, neuroscientists have called domestication. And so we are domesticated into food, patterns uh, and you are so that we don't question them when we are adults. Don't and then we continue to, to, to follow to those patterns through all the way through our PhDs. And try to figure out um, but what it is, is training and domestication is not education. And yeah. And so, so that the uh, to undo that, dang, and what one of the things that it does is numbs your senses. And so you can no longer smell, taste, see, observe, share. Uh, storytelling goes away because now yes. there are rules on how you write yes. something, it's how you tell something. And if you beat around the bush, everybody looks at you with his eyes like, okay, come on, get to the point. Okay. So all of those things that are central to the, to the, our ability to be fully mentally developed are, are repressed and numbed so that we follow a pattern or behavior that is just good enough for us but it's definitely excellent for the extracting system to accumulate wealth. Now, on the opposite end, once you start tasting high quality food, and I'm telling you, we got loads, hundreds and hundreds of stories. There's this Italian fellow who worked for this very big painting company. And someone else told me the story that, that they brought a box of our chicken and put it in the fridge for workers to take home. And they got this Italian guy stealing the rest of the chickens. And, and so they, they corner him and ask him, oh, well, why are you doing that? He says, this is the best chicken. This is the best chicken. He said, well, you can ask for more. No, there were no more. I needed the last one. <laughs> so the thing is, yes, those, are, those senses are right there waiting, waiting for us to develop further. Exposing ourselves to experiences like that is the way to re-educate the senses and to recuperate that innate intelligence. And that's why I'm saying that intellectual awareness which then awakens your senses and rewires your brain and all of that is only acquired to meditation through exposing yourself to nature, uh, especially uh, growing or finding somebody who grows nutritionally dense foods that you know have integrity, and then really you know, preparing your body and your mind to receive that. Because if you are reverent about that food, if you actually give thanks for that food in whatever way you, you find it appropriate. Um, and, then, and then you take the time to actually eat that with, you know, and absorb everything in it. Sometimes food that you never thought had flavor suddenly is the most flavorful thing on earth. 
And the reason is simply you now awaken your numbed senses. And if you, if you actually look at the science behind a lot of this, when you are in the forest, and that it explains a lot of my, my complications with smells and, and, and just reflexes and stuff that you just don't know because you just lived in that environment. But in the forest, when you are, when it gets dark and you don't use artificial lights or anything and you just allow darkness and everything to come around you, our bodies actually have a way to adjust and to sharpen all kinds of senses that will never happen if you are always exposed to artificial systems. And so that is part of this intellectual awareness and this intellectual insurgency that we have to pursue. And it just happens to be beautiful as well. So it's not only re-engages you and regenerates you as a human, but also re-engages your senses. And now you can enjoy life exponentially more. And what is the point of living if it isn't the enjoyment of life at the end? And you're a, apparently a wonderful manifestation of that. You have a smile on your face <laughs> with every sentence and you're so uh, joyful. It's wonderful um, just to, yeah. And thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, so good. Well, um, I'm not sure what our next date is together, but I'm looking forward to the uh, <laughs> <laughs> the conclusion of this of this presentation. This is a really, really um, mind, um, not just mind, but sort of sense making um, process. That's I'm really grateful that you're walking us through. So I'm grateful for all of you and for energy for sticking to this and for allowing yourself to to just be here. Um, if you felt uncomfortable, I. I'm thankful for that too. And I hope you too are thankful um, because it is in the discomfort where you create new synapses. It is in the discomfort you make new friends. It is in the discomfort that lifetime relationships are built. If you're not willing to do that, you are lonely. And loneliness is not a good thing if you're a human. So thank you for coming out and, and for being part of this journey with all of us. It is a journey for all of us. It doesn't matter where we are in it. Still yeah. a journey left to go. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Until next time. Bye.